The Reef Therapy Podcast is powered by ICP Analysis. If you'd like to win a free saltwater ICP analysis kit and a freshwater analysis kit, all you have to do is leave a comment down below using the hashtag what's in your water. If you're listening to the audio only version, head on over to YouTube and you can enter in the comment section there. ICP Analysis will test over 50 elements down to parts per trillion. These tests can also be used to see if there's any undesirable elements in your aquarium as well. Register your aquarium on the ICP Analysis app, fill your sample, place it back into the bag, slap on that included postage, and have your results one to three days after it's received. More at icpanalysis.com. Hey, Reef Builders, welcome to another episode of Reef Therapy. We are at Reefstock Denver 2024, and a very special episode of Reef Therapy here with, uh, we've, we've tried to come up with some names. Is this the Bacterial Boys? Is this the Bacterial Brains? What are we, what are we calling ourselves? Any, any thoughts on that? Microbial men. Men, microbial men. men. I like that. <laughs> well, first, let's just get right into this. Let's go around the horn. Go ahead and say your name, introduce yourself, and then we'll get right into this talk. Cool. All right. I'm Eli Meyer from Aquabiomics, the DNA testing company. I'm Andrew Bauma. Kenneth Winger from Hydrospace. Uh, Taras Pluskin, Top Shelf Aquatics. Salem Clemens, Reef Builders. I think I want to start this conversation off with why, why should we be paying attention to bacteria? You know, if I'm, a, if I'm a regular hobbyist at home and I'm just looking at my corals, why is this something that's so important? Why is this something that we're just now really talking about in the hobby? I mean, I'll say one part of the answer in my mind is that we were already paying attention to bacteria. Everybody who ever tried to cycle their tank was already trying to manipulate the microbial community in their tank. Another part of the answer, why, why are we just now getting into this, the DNA sequencing technology over the last 10 to 20 years has completely changed the field. Um, we now have new ways to detect and analyze the microbial community. So I think that's a big part of it. The tech changes and so what we can see changes. So I think my question from yesterday was, okay, so we've got this information now. I'm average hobbyist. We've got the information. Now what do we do with it? You know. Do I need to have a, someone like a Salem or an Eli go ahead and take me through every single one of these uh, bacteria that shows up on my on my test, or what's next after that? So I'll jump in there. So I'm I'm somebody who's uh, I'm a hobbyist, and I've done I think 60 tests from Eli's service. I've followed my main display system over four years, and I have a very complete picture of the microbiome in my system. And I you can follow to where the tank became cycled where the community became uh, stable and where I had problems with bacterial diseases. And um, I've posted a bunch of uh, the main points of that on Instagram to try to share some of the things that I've learned from that time series from my tank. And so um, for start, you could look at that. Salem, do you have anything to add here? So yeah, the question is what can we do with that information? Do we need consultation? I think as of now, um, there's a lot of lack of applicable information, right? So we can see what microbial families are there, how it can change over a course of time. But even at the edge of science right now, we're not quite sure what all these families do, which one are core symbionts that need to be there, which ones are more, you know, can go away and they can I have other species come in and fill that role in the eco ecosystem. So I think that overall, there will probably need to be a community effort to elude a lot of these things and determine through, you know, more anecdotal testing, maybe controlled in some way, what works and what doesn't, whether that's different carbon dosing methods, whether that's maybe selective antibiotic use, what have you. I mean, wonderful points perhaps so far, but I mean, just in general, any hobby or human endeavor that has been treated seriously, where it's applicable directly, is microbial. People have taken it seriously. If it's cheese making, wine making, beer making, the average brewer does not know how to gene sequence, yet they cannot tell you enough how important it is that they have their yeast. Uh, for lack of a better term, there might be a trickle-down benefit where there's a spearhead forward with technology and techniques that are available to only a select few, but the benefits of that, the, the quote-unquote good sauce that's made, uh, could be applied and, and, and put a great many people on the right step. And just having a dialogue like that, you know, there are children watching this now that will learn they'll think that we're a bunch of baboons compared to what's already going to be established by the time that they're in their early 20s. So I think that there's uh, only benefit to pursuing and you know, it's going to be a lot more misses than hits, but uh, yeah. Yeah, you brought up a good point with the food part of that. 
Um, would you say that's the same complexity as in aquarium in the bacterial microbiome? We're talking about yeast, right? It seems to me like it's a very simple thing. And it seems like there are tons more things going on in our tank than just that. Well, of course, the reef aquarium is incomprehensibly confounding and complex compared to... Uh, but the idea here is, 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 is math and the idea of building tools. If you can understand the principle without having any knowledge of that it's even a germ that's doing it, of fermentation like you know people did way thousands of years ago, we can take that and, and compound that our, ourselves, that understanding of, well, there are probably things that are conducting all these various different activities. And then, you know, by using the tools we have today and using these models that we've actually practically demonstrated through making cheese, making wine, making probiotics, making algae in a single celled controlled environment, we can begin to extrapolate what they might be doing in our limited contained environments and then potentially even more wonderfully, we might be able to understand how they might be operating in the even more incomprehensible world of the wild oceans and wild reefs. And when all three of these realms meet, the wielding of the microbes like a tool, the understanding of them for something as creation of beauty and an aesthetic sense like the reef aquariums, and then something that's very pragmatic, being able to understand the absolute power of everything that derived the other two. If we can meet and reconcile all three of these things, well, well, that'll be a power that will be, you could create way more great things than the greatest reef tank on earth would yeah. be even the beginning of a Giving me goosebumps, Taras. <laughs> <laughs> very poetic. Uh, so everybody made good points, but I think from the most practical sense, uh, I think Everybody already understands that uh, my, the microbial world is like the base of any ecosystem, including a captive ecosystem. The problem up until now, and maybe somewhat now, is that people uh, don't know what to do with it. We hear the word, how is this actionable, asked all the time. Uh, so part of that is having uh, known organisms that we can actually apply to our systems and then also knowing uh, what's in the system. So that's basically what, you know, Eli provides an incredibly valuable service now because we can actually analyze our systems and see what's in them and see how they change over time and as we change techniques or um, make any kind of changes to our systems. But then, you know, stuff like people like what I do, trying to find target species that are uh, widely applicable for our you know, our purposes, uh, more people get in the game for that, then we'll have a lot more actions that we can actually take somewhat purposefully. Sure. Um, I know this is a controversial subject, and I know you may have differing opinions on this, but let's just go down the line and talk about antibiotics for the reef tank. <laughs> Salem, you want to start? Yeah. I, I know you're so. pretty passionate about this. <laughs> uh, one, prophylactic use is probably pretty bad. Resistance, wiping out symbionts, we don't know what we're doing, you know. We don't know what we eliminate, we don't know what we're targeting. I think everything's pretty polymicrobial, there's not one bad guy, there's an assortment of bad guys, there's opportunistic uh, issues as well, so coral goes through a stress event, some of its symbionts that are good at the time can become bad, so wiping those out can eliminate a lot of metabolic function later on if the coral can recover to a more symbiotic state instead of a dysbiotic state, so there's simply, there is a lot of ignorance even in academia about these families and how they can shift over time in response to external stress. So <laughs> why are we combining four different antibiotics at an unknown dosage at a random contact time? You know, it, does, it makes zero sense to me. It is a shot in the dark that is very, based on a very ignorant uh, basis, I think. Now, I think there is a place for targeted use of antibiotics, at least as of now. I think that there will be future replacements for them that will be much better, but obviously they are a tool that can be utilized. So for instance, if there is a known pathogen and there is an excess of that in a system and we can apply at least the most selective antibiotic we can and then potentially try to remediate the microbiome afterwards through, you know, what are now rudimentary methods, addition of live rock, live sand, uh, Eli's sand that has been screened for pathogens. I think that's at least a a decent pathway, but diagnosis is needed. It's the same concept as don't dose what you don't test for. We have a way to test for things, and I think that that should be done first before dosing. And what are the, some, some of the common antibiotics? I mean, I, and we all know what's used in the hobby, but 
what are the antibiotics that you hear about people are just like throwing in their tanks for whatever reason? I know erythromycin is one that's kind of widely used and you know god knows what's really available because you know you can you can get a hold of a lot of stuff and apply it to your tank but and god knows what's actually being applied but to carry on from salem statement in a very general sense um it's much more a benefit at the current state we have at the very highest echelons of understanding that we try and focus our effort on understanding how these systems work it's a lot more constructive to understand how a pest algae lives, where it came from, a pest bacteria, anything. You know, it's much more useful to understand how it lived and how it thrived for understanding what other benefits might come from that understanding, but also, incidentally, how to eliminate it. Um, 20th century medicine up until this point has shown us what the limitations are of trying to kill these microbes with conventional means. You kill them, they become stronger and very often you mess with systems that you simply do not understand and you create far more instability. Um, there's a lot more benefit to trying to understand how these things live, at least now. Um, should antibiotics be used in a veterinarian sense? Yes. Should they be used in, in, a, in a melody and applied at random by the average hobbyist? Probably not. Ken? I just concur with what they said. Um, even just before I came to Reefstock, I finished a test I've done on my own bacteria with Cipro. Uh, kind of hoping that it would survive the treatment, um, and it actually wiped it out completely. Uh, that particular species is actually naturally occurring on the reef, not just on and around, but with inside of corals. So when we do these proactive prophylactic treatments, sometimes we're actually wiping out, it seems, a lot of uh, beneficial, naturally occurring symbionts, which to me seems a little bit counterproductive when you're trying to uh, strengthen and prop up, you know, a, a stressed out, newly acquired specimen. So I think if we do this um, more as needed, I think, you know, like we said, more of a veterinary approach. Obviously, there's a place for antibiotics, but just willy nilly doesn't seem to be the right answer. And uh, even if we want to keep doing that, uh, there will be consequences, even if they're just legal or because we're, we're losing the ability to use some of these now because of our history of misuse. Yeah, it seems like everybody on this couch, is, it's a, it's about the slow play, right? But the hobbyist is all about the, what can I throw in my tank to get rid of this whatever pest immediately? And they might see some results off the bat, but the consequences of that down the road, you know, may show their, their ugly faces at some point, correct? Yeah, I like to think about antibiotic use as like I would think about a fire extinguisher. A fire extinguisher is a very important tool to have. And if you have a fire in your house, you're gonna use your fire extinguisher to put it out. And so if you treat antibiotics like a fire extinguisher, you have it there in case you have something that's killing all your corals. Um, and it's a tool that has been shown to be effective. Um, I, I've used oxalonic acid recently and it's been, it's been effective, but only as a last resort. And just like I wouldn't prophylact prophylactically coat my walls of my house with a fire extinguisher to prevent a fire, I don't prophylactically uh, treat my corals with an antibiotic to prevent infection. And so it's an important tool that if we overuse, um, will not be there for us in the future. Because um, I, I very much think the future of the hobby in terms of managing bacteria is going to be probiotics. Um, the Europeans, for example, already don't have access to any antibiotics. And so uh, shared strategies for managing bacteria in the reefing hobby in the future are going to be mostly probiotic, I think. This turned out to be a little less controversial than thought. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> seems, like we, seems like we have pretty wide agreement on this. I'm, I'm in the same boat. You know, let's not use them prophylactically. Let's use them as needed as a last resort. Uh, a few comments I'd add. Um, I think it's important to consider dose. So just as one example of the approach I'd advocate, when I was trying to cure infections with Archibacter, I looked up what is the minimum concentration that would kill Archibacter but not other species. And I, and I went with that minimum concentration. I think this is an approach we should all consider. Don't, don't hit it with a sledgehammer, hit it with a scalpel. Mm -hmm. um, another point I'd like to make is um, the choice of antibiotics. It would be really good if we could avoid using antibiotics that are used in human medicine on our reef tanks. Because one of the major problems with overuse of antibiotics is the development of uh, antibiotic resistance. And I would not like to develop 
antibiotic resistance in my own microbial community that might lead to problems with treating, you know, illness later. Um, and I guess my last, my last statement on the subject is, uh, it would be really nice if all the aquarium products actually listed their ingredients so you knew if you were adding an antibiotic. People have discussed adding erythromycin, and I think we all know what we're talking about here. People, people aren't adding a bottle that's labeled erythromycin. Um, so that's, that's another complicating issue I see for this is the, um, the unlabeled nature of a lot of our, our products. Yeah. I want to talk about bacteria as a nutritional value for the aquarium anybody want to speak on that right off the bat like i know ken you're you're obviously you've got a bunch of products that you can feed the tank quote um can you talk about some of those and how they benefit so according to some studies the bacteria we sell are some are quite abundant in the natural environment and known to be associated with corals symbiotically but also their uh, food source um and uh most most sources i think are pretty much in agreement that bacterial plankton form the bulk of uh, most corals diets. Obviously it's going to vary from uh, uh, range to range and species to species and even between seasons, but overall it's obviously a humongous, co oh, humongous component of a corals diet. Uh, so uh, if we have a source sort of like we do phytoplankton of bacterial plankton now that could help to you know, better provide uh, nutrition for corals generally. Uh, just a quick example, um, comparing algae, uh, algae are uh, obviously very rich in fatty acids, uh, not particularly high in protein, whereas the bacteria we produce anyway are often over 50% protein, rich in B vitamins, but again, don't necessarily have everything Phyto has, so they're more complementary than something that you trade off. So as we have a better availability of these types of food in the industry, I think we could provide better and more natural food for corals overall. Taras, I feel like you have a statement about oh, this. Oh, just in a very general sense, but also definitely directly related to the reef industry. The idea of utilizing microbial proteins and foods of any kind is, is, is entirely the direction we need to go, Owen. This is the capacity to produce food to feed anything, humans all the way down to, to, to carp, to <laughs> corals, to everything, a way that we can produce them in the most efficient way, using the least amount of resources in a way that might even be replicable you know, out in space in a very limited environment. Um, having that kind of control is immediately tied to the conscience of the reef aquarium industry. Fish meal, fish oil, the fatty acids produced that, 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 that Ken was referring to, these all come from wild industrial forage fisheries, primarily off the coast of Africa and South America. All of that is produced by the ocean by microbes, phytoplankton and complemented by all kinds of bacteria plankton. This is then concentrated inside of, of various different zooplankton and concentrated inside of anchovies and other forage fish. These are then scooped up, gurried, smashed, rendered in a very inefficient and bar almost barbaric way so that they can be dried and have a very, 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 very small amount of that power, that fuel, dried out and then, you know, given so that it can be cut into a very small amount into the fees. And then this, this, these fats and some of these other things are so very important that they, we can't really make any effective reef foods of any kind, no, no reef roids or anything without, without having some sort of actual source of this from the ocean. If we can replicate that, in a way that we can make it in like Wisconsin or the middle of Nebraska or the middle of upstate New York, we, if we can make things that are just as good, the reef aquarium industry can, can, can one, get a better control of the foods that they're putting in their tank because there's not only just fatty acids coming in on that fish meal, there's all kinds of other things like vanadium and all kinds of things that are bioaccumulating inside of those fish. Everyone knows mercury as well over time. Um, we can have better control over that, and then we can have a better conscience knowing that not only are our, our fish and our vertebrates and our corals less and less dependent on wild stocks, but the food, the things that fuel them, the things that they, for lack of a better word, crap out that we would flush away, isn't just being ripped from the ocean. We can make that now, and then that could translate to all kinds of other stuff that <laughs> make, make our kids live on Mars someday. <laughs> yeah, I, I like the idea of bacteria as a nutrition source. So, I mean, right now, like, We've got pods, we've got phyto, we've got rotifers. There are some bacterial products. There's, you know, uh, bacteria plankton that exists. But, you know, if we were able to find 
this goes along with the probiotic thing, so you can have a double-edged sword where you have a coral-associated microbe, which also can act as a, a heterotrophic feeding source. And I think that right now, while there are options, we are severely lacking that trophic level in terms of nutrition. And I think that exploring that and developing new, potentially more efficient and novel or, you know, strains and getting them cultured in bulk can allow us to be much more successful with niche species. So for instance, dendroneptia, right? Phytoplankton simply won't cut it sometimes, no matter how much you add. So this is completely just like, you know, I was bored. So I started culturing Bacillus subtilis, which is, you know, co commercial kind of terrestrial strain. And I had success keeping uh, dendroneptia, scalarioneptia, and things like that with them. And then I kept upping the dosage until finally I crashed my tank because I had a bloom large enough to took out the oxygen. So, you know, that experiment ended, but obviously having a marine strain that is coral associated, they could work in the same light. You could have other benefits external just to just the nutrition there. And I think that that could be a very, very powerful tool. And maybe we could have some NPS aquariums in the future where you just add a bottle instead of having a fridge with like, you know, everything plumbed in and you dose like 12 different food types. So yeah, having a bacterial food source, you've got phytoplankton, you can do rotifers, you can do pods, and you've got like, you know, macroscopic food, pellets, mice, whatever, and you kind of have all level, like all trophic levels for nutrition. So I think there's that hole that needs to be filled. And uh, I think the people here and anyone listening, we should begin to try to fill that. Yeah, I was gonna say, besides bacteria that you add um, to your tank, you can also manage the microbiome of your tank. Uh, one of the things that Eli has found in his testing is that the most important group in um, healthy reef tanks is the Pelagibacteraceae, which is a part of the picoplankton on natural reefs. It's the most abundant uh, picoplankton on the Great Barrier Reef microbiome, for example. And the literature, there's data from the literature that suggests that corals feed on um, the Pelagibacteraceae preferentially over other groups. And so um, one of the things that I found in monitoring over four years my display tank is that my corals do the best, my system does the best when I have a dominant Pelagibacteraceae family in the, the plankton, in the water. And so we can also manage our own microbiomes in our, in our tanks, uh, presumably it's helping the corals out tr nutritionally. When we were talking last night at the shop, at the studio, you had mentioned that that old tank syndrome kind of crept in. So you, there's other bacteria that are coming. So you can actually raise the plagiobacter, right? Or you've actually done that or tried it? Yeah, so one of the things, so Eli and I were on Reef Bum um, uh, talking about the time series of my microbiome data on my tank. And we saw that a couple years into um, the establishment of my tank, I started to have a greater proportion of Rotobacteraceae and a smaller proportion of Pelagibacteraceae. And the Rotobacteraceae um, are detritus-loving bacteria. They're found on surfaces. They also contain a number of pathogens. And in my system, as the ratio of the Rotobacteraceae to the Pelagibacteraceae went up, I started to have issues with STN, brown jelly, and a number of things. And so I took a number of corrective actions to reduce the detritus in my system. I added, I actually uh, dosed a PNSB for a, for a time. I added a, um, a filter roller, um, several things to uh, reduce the detritus in the tank. It, and it, my, micro, my, my microbiome uh, swung back to pelagi dominated and my corals have been doing great since. Eli, do you think that that's, uh, that's key, having that pelagiobacter as the dominant strain? It, it certainly seems to, be beneficial. Um, I think many of us are puzzled by the observation that there are there are reefers out there running very successful reef tanks with UV sterilizers that almost completely lack this group, and yet it's a very successful and healthy reef tank. Um, perhaps in those systems there is another group that substitutes well for it. Perhaps another bacteria plankton group that is equally useful as a food source. Um, I'd say the jury is very much still out on that, but I. Yeah, I wouldn't want to say it's um, essential, mandatory to have this group because we've seen, you know, enough examples that you can be successful without it. But within a tank, as, as Andy's example showed with this great time series, within a tank, it's very clear that it's associated with, with a benefit. All this discussion of bacteria in the reef tank as a food source just makes me want to emphasize that 
this is this is another reason why the microbial community in your tank matters. Um, you know, at a s simplistic level, we can think about this as if the corals eat the wrong thing, it's like food poisoning, right? They're eating the wrong bacterial source. And if they eat the right thing, perhaps, perhaps the benefit is a better nutritional profile in certain bacterial groups, or perhaps it's simply avoiding food poisoning. Um, so I think there's a lot of unknowns left here, but just highlighting that the nutritional role of bacteria is another reason they may be very important uh, for our corals. You guys make my brain hurt. <laughs> uh, but it's great information. If I'm a hobbyist, I'm listening to this podcast right now, and I want to pick up an aquabiomics test for the first time, what should I expect, Eli? It works very similar to ICP, the, the overall structure. You know, you place an order, we send you a sample kit, you take a sample, ship it back to us, and we analyze your sample. Um, when we're done analyzing it, we will send you an email with a link to the report, and you can evaluate the results of your test. Um, all my comparison to ICP has an important difference, though. This does take longer. You know, it, it takes two to four weeks to get your results, so, so plan accordingly. I've been telling people all weekend, look, if you've got a fish that's sick and you want to know what to treat it with, this is not the right situation for a test because the fish will probably die before you get your results. But there's a lot of other situations where the time scale is perfectly appropriate. And so that's the, that's the other comment I would make for new users is plan it, plan it accordingly. Plan okay. with that time frame in mind. Uh, uh, what were the, I just say, go for it. when your tank is looking great, that's an awesome time to do an aquabiomics analysis actually. Yeah, you, you, had, you had laid out four different great times to take a measurement or to take a sample. One of those was a new tank, right. which I did. What were the other three? Yeah, so if you lose a fish or coral and you think you have a parasite or pathogen in your tank, that's a good time to take a test um, because, you know, waiting a few weeks to find out what that pathogen or parasite is isn't, isn't really a big problem. It's probably not a good idea to add another fish or coral that, that soon anyway. Um, uh, another situation is quarantine. So many of us are quarantining our fish for many weeks, a month or more. So if you take a, take a sample early in the quarantine process, you'll get your results in time to release that fish out into your, your tank. And then the one I'm most excited about, and I hope we can have some discussion about here, is um, controlled, well-replicated experiments by hobbyists using this service. In, in this context, the time frame is not a problem at all. Yeah, well, let's get into that. I mean, uh, Taras, you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I could not agree more. I, I, I can only imagine, you know, talking about all this pelagic bacteria. You, 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 a couple of years ago, especially, you get out in a boat, you're a scientist, you got this grant, you go out there. It, uh, you take like a small little sample of a reef. Uh, let's say you take 100 samples. You got to go all the way back because at the time the PCR is like, you know, the size of a three computers that community has already changed i and there's only you know so much grant so much formal so many pelagic bacteria nuts out there that are formal the people the idea that the hobbyists the, the whole industry here can be the, every single aquarium um can be an anecdotal forage mine of information especially if there's some sort of documented information uh, going through that, but the idea that all this can be directly translated into controlled experiments where we can begin to kind of understand a little bit, you know, kind of have our own lab rat version of, of a wild coral reef for the first time to be observed on a microbial level from its inception all the way throughout. That, that's so invaluable for a lot of these things. I can't imagine trying to understand that directly, like in situ, like in Sulawesi or somewhere. Well, take us through what that would look like. Or what what would be valuable information to you, Eli, other than just you know me sending in a sample because I'm curious about my tank. Sure. What kind of experiments could I run, and how would I do that? Yeah. So some great discussions we've been having this weekend are about organizing these things, you know, through the community, through the hobby community. Um, there's a lot of factors that we're all interested in. One of the topics we've talked about is carbon dosing. Um, different carbon sources will surely promote the growth of different microbial groups in the aquarium. This is, this is a certainty, but we just don't know which, which sources promote which groups at this point. So there's an example of an experiment that could be easily run by hobbyists. Um, maybe we can get together and coordinate this in some way. And then hobbyists could have a good data-based reason 
for adding a particular carbon source to their tank rather than just blindly pouring in carbon of any kind. Very long list of experiments, but that's that's one we've been talking about. Yeah, Salem, did you, did you want to comment on this? Yeah, so there will certainly be a Reef Builders article and probably a prolonged video about this. Um, I, I think we'll talk a lot more this weekend about how to structure this. And But likely for the hobbyists out there listening, if you would like to join this program, hopefully at the time of this being posted, we'll have a link you can click to where you can actually sign up for it. Um, it'll likely have pretty strict controls, at least as good as we can do, to try to make this a little bit more data-driven. And uh, the idea would probably be, you know, multiple time points, I'm sure. So you're going to have the baseline and then before, after, maybe three, four time points. And um, yeah, so carbon dosing, I think, would be the first one. That'd be very beneficial. But there's plenty of other things that we can do in the future. But um, yeah, reef stock has been great. I had a conversation about three in the morning the other day with Chris Meckley and Sanjay. And that was a very interesting conversation to be a part of. And uh, Chris was going, you know, down the rabbit hole with something he was messing with and saying, I should talk to people about this. And Sanjay said, you should use those monkeys in a barrel. We have a whole community of people. Throw the idea out there and let them test it. And then I said, well, why don't you get data behind it? We have a way to test the microbiome now. And I think that this is a perfect coalescing of old and new methods. We can use those monkeys in a barrel, but now we can arm them with a way to generate actual usable data. And that's something that can change the hobby. And maybe, you know, someday, maybe it can influence how we care for corals in a more professional sense. Conservation projects, um, you know, in aquariums. So I think this is very promising and that you or any individual out there could be a part of changing things for the better that could impact coral conservation in the future. The you is the person watching this. <laughs> we have one audience member right now. It is Joe Caparata of Unique Corals. <laughs> That's the you. Um, all of all of the aquabiomics, um, all of the testing is all based in data right now. So right, the more aquariums you have tested, the more clarification we have as the tanks progress through their through their maturity correct yeah that's right i mean as the database grows we're learning we're learning more just from looking at the database itself but there's a there's a challenge to that big database approach and that is everybody's reef tank is very different uh, it's hard to find two reef tanks anywhere that are run in exactly the same way and so we have differences that we're interested in, like this UV sterilizer signal that we talked about, but that's confounded with all kinds of other differences among these tanks, right? And so, yes, I, we are seeing that as the database grows, we learn more, but the need for controlled experiments is, is greater than ever. Um, if we could do some carefully controlled and replicated experiments on these, on these things, we could learn more in a single experiment than we would learn by gathering data for everyone's tanks over the course of years. Yeah. yeah. I think that there's, I, I would be remiss if I did not mention the skepticism that mm -hmm. surrounds this community of bacterial, you know, whether that be products or testing or whatever. What would you say? I mean, Andrew, you've done a lot of these tests, so you're, you know, kind of a a veteran in the testing realm, or at least sending them in and getting a good picture. What would you say to the hobbyist that's maybe on the fence about going through and getting their first test? There's university researchers that are using Eli's service for their own research. So if it's good enough for peer-reviewed publications there in the, in the research community, it's certainly good enough for the hobbyist. Um, some of the skepticism comes from uh, interpreting, uh, interpreting results and uh, whether you can whether you can interpret them in a way that's useful i would say that if you're stuck on your results um the humblefish forum has an has an aquabiomics um sub forum where a lot of people post questions about their results and that's a good place to go and other users that have had a lot of results can weigh in and and uh, that's a good place to go to get some questions answered Tross, i would say because this is a very science heavy discussion science heavy panel and the hobbyists the hobby is something of art, leisure. I'd say art. I'm comfortable with that. Um, what is a coral? I guess I would ask that to the, the theoretical person asking the hypothetical question. Is the coral the, 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 the critter of the skeleton? Is it the, the color? Is it an object that you bought? 
what is your relationship to that coral? Is it something that you own? Is it this, this object or is it something you're trying to understand? Something that, you know, maybe not in a strictly scientific sense, you want to understand it, but you want it, you look at it. There's a wonder. There's a, you walked through your first LFS reef shop and you stopped and you saw it and your jaw dropped. What is it? Why did your jaw drop? Why did your eyes pop when you saw it? It's like seeing a painting by Michelangelo. You don't need to know all the different names of the different chips of paint he used. But you don't care about, to say that you don't care about those chips, and if there's a discussion about those, that's the, the mosaic of it all, where the science hits the, the context of it all, the art. It's the, if they ask that question, I ask them why why do you like the way it looks? Why does it make you feel? You, you spend your money, you work hard, you, you get your heart broken by these things and you try again. Don't you wanna know as much as you can about them? Don't you wanna know why you, you thought they're so darn cool that you felt the need to make one out of where there otherwise would just be air in your living room? I love when Taras gets passionate. <laughs> Salem, did you have something to add? <laughs> that was very deep. Yeah, coral is art. Coral is an object, but they're animals. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, I would say with any new, innovative thing that could truly change things, there's always a lot of hate. Uh, you know, when the car first came out, the horse and buggy industry sure didn't like it and sure didn't understand it. And I think that this is all extremely novel. And I think to the average person thinking that we can go and look at the entire microbiome, I mean, next generation sequencing has been, what, the last 20 years? The last 10, it's really taken off? I mean, these are things that are, like say Eli has taken something that's being applied in academia writ large that has changed our entire conception of biology towards, you know, looking at things as ecosystems, as meta-organisms, and he's taken it and applied it to the hobby. Of course people are not going to understand it and are going to think it's fake. It's completely changed our conceptualization of all biological systems to where ecological principles are even more important now, but just it's a microcosm of a macrocosm. The coral itself is an ecosystem and a larger ecosystem. These are very complicated and complex issues, but it's, they're not fake. They're just, they're new. And I'd say to anything that's truly loved or to be truly loved, got to be a little bit hated. I hate you a little bit, Salem. <laughs> <laughs> Ken, I, I want to go to you on this because you sell the juice. You know, you sell the juice. What am I throwing in my tank when I'm, when I'm uh, buying your juice? It's all witchcraft. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's all voodoo. <laughs> well, you know, so anybody could do what I do. And, I, you know, there's so many different beneficial species out there that you could use. They all have different, uh, there's some overlap, but um, if you really want to shoot for something that's good for a food or good for uh, denitrification, good for eliminating... Uh, organic carbon wastes, uh, the list goes on, probiotics and so forth. Um, there are different species for that, literally tens of thousands or what millions, really, technically. So uh, there's a long way to go with this, but um, uh, it's something that uh, is wide open and there are a lot more people that could jump in this. And uh, I think it, again, going back to the whole part of this being actionable uh, when people feel like they can act they can go out and select a product and that it's properly labeled so that they know what species is in it and they know what that species will do it it helps a lot so that's maybe the one thing i don't it's necessarily addressing your question directly but i think for a start we need to start uh properly labeling what species are in our products yeah so that you know we know first of all whether or not we should buy them and then what to expect that they'll do yeah yeah and let me suggest this is another place that the hobby can step in so manufacturers like ken can voluntarily label their products but we all know there's many other manufacturers out there who are not choosing to label their products however you the hobbyist are free to buy a bottle send it in and have us test it for you and then you can release release the data to the hobby so there's no obstacle anymore to knowing all of the ingredients on all these uh, microbial products out there. Shout out Telegram. <laughs> no, I was going to say, <laughs> there are some vigilantes out there. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll just say that, yeah, I mean, if, if you're complaining or not even complaining, you're asking the legitimate question of how is this actionable, uh, take some action. Community-based science, like we're going to have promoted here, hopefully with a link in the bio, 
uh, that's how you can take action to actually begin to answer these questions. And I think also you can take action by choosing products that are transparent. So putting pressure on companies to be transparent through your choice as a consumer and also taking effort and part of our community-based program. If you want it to be actionable, let's do the work. And that takes all of us as a community. So if you care about keeping these animals, you care about them as a species, you want that art to look you know, the best it can, there's things you can do as a hobbyist. It's not just us, it's not just researchers, and it's not just the vendors at this convention, but it is really a community-based effort. And we need your help. Yeah. Let's do it. One of the biggest questions I've been asked since I've you know, done the videos about the live sand that I put in my tank to, to get you know, the microbiome up to snuff in there to get you know nitrifying bacteria and all that stuff, all the good stuff from the ocean in my tank is, well, you had a coral pathogen that came up in your aquabiomics test and you also had uranema that came up in your aquabiomics test. So are we still on the live sand, live rock train or are we better to start our tanks with dry and bottled bacteria? I mean, well, I'm, it's not, a, not an ambiguous answer for me. My experience has been that the dry rock and bottled bacteria approach just fundamentally doesn't work as well as the live sand and live rock approach. Um, I know it's a very controversial sh subject, but I'll say in my experience, it's been an unambiguous answer. Uh, if it were actually like a bottled bacteria versus live rock contest or something, I don't see the point. They're two completely different things. Uh, Live rock, of course, is going to give you a lot of diversity, but then bottled products give you control. So if you're trying to modify your microbiome in some particular way, you have a concentrated form of a known species that is viable that you can add immediately. So they're two completely different, you know, for food, for example, you're not going to get, you know, the densities off of live rock of the food that you, you know, you add on a daily basis, whereas in a bottle that will be a concentrate that, you know, you can actually get all that, deliver enough nutrition to the reefs. So two totally different things. Um, I love live rock and I can't, I don't know how we, I don't, I can't even believe it's a controversy. I, maybe I just come from a time where, you know, it, uh, it was some. It was just something everybody did and we had really good results from it. Not just the, the bacteria, but all the other cool little critters that came on it at play a role in a uh, functionally in an uh, aquarium ecosystem. So I think the bottled bacteria is just like a cherry on top, honestly, to kind of fine tune what you would get with live rock. Yeah. Dross? I, I, in, the way I envision it, I liken it to a city. You know, you have a city, th there's an incomprehensible amount of jobs that it requires to operate a city. And even then, just the baseline of keeping the lights on is not the city. Um, we do know that cities need certain things, like, mace, like carpenters. You can't have a city of just carpenters. Probably won't be good results. You can dump as many carpenters as you can in there, but if they just keep woodworking, <laughs> and it, just, it might not work out. And frankly, that's where we are in the level of understanding. We can just kind of understand one actor at a time what they might be able to do in a reef tank. Um, so the idea that we would be able to um, confidently operate outside of Live Rock, outside of that little slice of everyone, little slice of an already operating city. You take a small enough chunk of a city and put it somewhere else, it will likely function fairly well. Um, but where we are right now, even the best bottled products are reliable carpenters, and it takes more than woodworking to build a city. Yeah, like you said, this would help if the uh ingredients were on the label, correct? <laughs> that way we would know. Salem? Yeah, so I would say, you know, over the last 10 years or so, like the zeitgeist has certainly shifted. You know, we, we have these two competing ideals now of the old school way versus Marco Rock, nitro, just a bottled bacteria. <laughs> yeah. And it's just... Um, you're never going to get past that way, though. No, I think you can. With dry rock, you're I, never, you never going to have past. So there's a middle ground, right? So... I think that, you know, there are legitimate arguments against live rock and live sand. Sustainability, for instance, if it's like the actual Aussie stuff, I don't know. It probably doesn't really impact the reef that much. We've got Caribbean ways to make it sustainable, put rock in the ocean, for instance, Fiji the same way. But you're, there, are, there are pests. It's not control. You get the biodiversity, but sure, it can come at a cost. You can have uranema. You can have known coral pathogens. So the way forward, I think, is a combination of these. It is a controlled diversity. So, for instance, Eli's sand. 
it has been screened for pathogens, but it still is more diverse than traditional methods. I think exploring something like that that combines these two ideals will be the way forward. And that will take a lot of infrastructure and time to develop a perfect method like that. But at least with something like the sand, maybe it won't have as much diversity or maybe it lacks species that might be found on live rock from different locales that might be beneficial we don't even know about. But it's better than just the completely sterile approach. You have maybe a carpenter and you have a trash man and you have someone that can do, you have an accountant in there compared to the whole city, but that's a step in the right direction. So maybe the next 5, 10, 20 years of the hobby, as we develop you know, products for this, we get monocultures, we get better at these things, and technology and money and time goes with it, maybe we'll have a way to have controlled diversity. But that's at least a step in the right direction and probably where we need to be hitting. I really liked what Salem said about controlled diversity. Another, another approach to getting controlled diversity is something we're exploring now that is culturing live rock. Um, and I don't mean out in the ocean where it's out of your control, I mean in a tank, in a controlled greenhouse environment. Um, when we do this, personally, I think it's going to be valuable to use nice porous coral rubble or something like coral rubble as the base for it. But this approach will allow us to then uh, control what goes into it. Um, so that's something we're working on now, and I know others are working on around the country. Um, it's going to be a somewhat long-term process because it does take some time to grow live rock, um, but I think it's another way forward with this controlled diversity. Is that kind of the same approach with the live sand that you guys have? So the, the live sand that I'm getting right now is collected in nature. It's, it's collected at deep offshore sites, um, and then we bring it in and we just test it. So with the live sand, I'm not really doing any long-term culturing. It's just maintaining it and testing it before I sell it out. Um, the rubble you know, frankly, the the wholesalers are not bringing in enough live rock and rubble these days, so we we just can't get it. So we've started getting dry rubble and trying to culture up uh, controlled diversity in it. Um, but yeah, our sand is really sand from nature. So I, I just wanted to weigh in that I I know everybody knows somebody who has set up a tank with dry rock and bottled bacteria, and or at least they've heard of somebody who's done it and has been successful. But your chances of having a, um, and not having to wait a really long time and not going through lots of problems are, you know, not, not great. It's, it's, uh, it's a lot harder thing to do. Your chances of being successful are going to be much greater if you combine some live sand, some reef rubble um, with, with dry rock and other, and other types of media. So, yes, it can be done, but it's very difficult and oftentimes people fail. And um, so you have to make that decision for yourself. Anecdotally, I will say that this is the first time I've ever used any kind of live uh, rock or sand from the ocean before. And I have skipped an amazing amount of, quote, the ugly part of a new tank. And I don't know if that is because of that entirely or if there's a whole you know, host of variables in there. But it's uh, something I probably will always do from now on whenever I'm setting up a new tank. Yeah, I'll say I have at least one experiment where we have we have good evidence of that, that there were, you know, we started tanks with live rock versus dry rock, and there was at least one point in their development where the dry rock tanks were in the deep, deep, dark part of the uglies, and the live rock tanks were fine. So, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think many of us have seen similar things. Yeah. Well, before we wrap up, I wanted to give it kind of a free-for-all if one of you wanted to say something or start a discussion before we, uh, before we wrapped up. But if there's anything that we have missed, which is a lot, what I'd like to say is that I'd like to have each one of you individually or in a couple groups, and we can break out on actual reef therapy in a more controlled environment <laughs> um, where there's not kids crying and dogs barking and things like that. But I'd really like to, to get into the nitty gritty of this stuff because I think a lot of people are interested in, in what you guys are doing. Yeah, I think we'll have to have uh, controlled diversity among us in the future. So, Are this, you kicking me out? Is that what you're saying, Salem? <laughs> no, no. I'm, I'm saying we've got a pretty diverse cast here, and I think together we could have some long-form content but uh, in a more controlled setting. Yeah. So if you want to see this again, but maybe like five hours, we get a case of Red Bull each, go on Squadcast, and we really break it out. We can screen share, we can show articles, we can break down the data and really dive into it. If that's something that interests you as a hobbyist, um, 
comment below. Yeah. And I think that we can have that, that controlled diversity somewhere at some other time in the future. You know, there are a lot of sponsors that you could be going after in the aquarium hobby. There's plenty. Going for Red Bull. <laughs> it gives me wings. <laughs> Anybody else have anything to say before we wrap up? No? I want to thank you guys so much. This has been so beneficial. And again, it's only the beginning. And I want to thank you guys for uh, taking time out of uh, your day here. I know, Ken, you've got a booth. Salem, you've got a booth. So thanks for coming over and uh, joining us on Reef Therapy. And we will see you in the next one.